Welcome to the Electronic Intifada podcast. I'm Asa Wynn Stanley, joined in the background as ever by our producer Tamara Nassar. And I'm here today with the journalist David Sheen. Now, David is a longtime contributor to the Electronic Intifada. For many years, he's been reporting on Jewish extremism inside the territories of historic Palestine, first occupied in 1948. That is to say, inside of present day Israel. Now, David is an expert on the phenomenon of what's known as Kahanism, the ultra-right followers of Maya Kahane, an extremist Zionist rabbi from New York City who founded the Jewish Defense League, a terrorist group that carried out a nationwide bombing campaign in the 1970s and 1980s. Kahane later moved to Israel where he founded the Kach Party and won a seat in the Israeli parliament on a platform of expelling all Palestinians from the entirety of historic Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And yeah, it, it, he, the party was later banned, yet today Kahani's followers are running some of the highest levels of the Israeli government. Itamar Ben-Gavir is a leading minister in Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition government. Ben-Gavir has long been a disciple of Kahane and has pursued openly genocidal policies in government. Now, way back in 2023, David wrote this in-depth article about how Kahanism has infiltrated U.S. politics and especially in the U.S. Democratic Party. A really fascinating topic that might be surprising to many. This article is really uh, an essential read. Now, my colleague Nora Barris-Friedman and myself filmed an episode with David back on the 4th of October 2023 only three days before the start of the current Israeli genocide against the Gaza Strip. Now, due, of course, to the whirlwind of other priorities we had at the time, the episode, um, you know, it was kind of neglected and we never aired it. It has never seen the light of day until now. So we've decided to air the episode now in full as we filmed it um, due to the fact that it's largely dealing with historic issues in our discussion Issues that are, in fact, m more relevant now than ever before, given the influence of the Kahanis on the Israeli government. Um, and if anything, it's only increased since we filmed this episode on the topic of David's long article about Kahanism and the US Democratic Party. So, David, you've just recently rewatched this episode that we filmed back last year. Um, is there anything you'd like to add now by way of an update since we filmed it? it's really something because it I, I i feel in many ways that it, it it's timeless i mean it, of course as things go along we're going to encounter more egregious examples of democratic party perfidy and we have in recent months um in fact if anything the thesis of the monograph has been born true that the democratic party can be even worse in some cases than the republican party you know, I listed a whole host of examples of how the party have uh, been strong allies to the Kahanists and helped them out in many ways over the courses of decades. But what we have in recent months is the, the culmination of all that. We have the president of the United States, who is the biggest recipient ever of APAC aid, supporting genocidal policies, supporting Kahana's policies. So, so on one hand, we have pretty much the entire Israeli electorate from the far right to what is considered the center left in Israel, meaning the Labour Party, the Labour Party that founded the country. Uh, but today it's headed by Yair Golan, uh, former army commander, deputy chief of staff. Um, and at the beginning of the war, just after October 7th and the days that followed, if you look at the public statements of Israeli leaders like Yair Golan, you would find that they're barely distinguishable from the statements of right-wing members of Knesset or ministers in the Israeli government. So the opposition and the coalition are almost uniform in saying we need to shut off water, we need to shut off food, we need to shut off electricity, we need to completely cut off the Gaza Strip and not let anyone in, anyone out. So these are the kinds of genocidal statements were, were made by Yair Gola. And, and so it's an example of how the whole country essentially was shock doctrined into Kahanism. They, you know, if before the war, 
the Qaddists were constantly calling for the reconquest of Gaza Strip. It was a regular feature amongst them. But then after the war, it, it became uh, commonplace to hear this from all sectors of society, pretty much. And as we will talk about in later episodes, it was actually people from the who, who sprung from the the well of racism that the Kahana movement flourished in in Kiryat Arba and Hebron. Uh, it was racists from that school that essentially were the most pivotal, in a way, of in in shock doctrine in that shock doctrine that we saw in the wake of October 7th. So really, the, the Kahanists have been extremely important in making that shift in Israeli society. And the Democratic Party has been very important in uh, supporting that shift and in arming that shift and in creating manufacturing consensus for that shift in Israeli society, Israeli policy. We've seen for months now that the Biden government has not stop shipments of arms to Israel, is continually backed it in international fora. So, you know, the the masses of dead are just as much on the Democratic Party's hands and the Biden's hands and they are in that India and Ben Gavir's hands. Thanks for that, David. Well, let's go to that discussion now. And just a reminder that the following interview was filmed on the 4th of October, 2023. So any time references to recent events should be understood in that context. Uh, today, we're delighted to be joined by our friend and longtime contributor to the Electronic Intifada, David Sheen, to talk about his latest monograph for the Institute for Palestine Studies journal, Current Issues in Depth entitled Kahanism and American Politics, the Democratic Party's Decades-Long Courtship of Racist Fanatics. According to the summary of the study, quote, American foreign policy on Israel and Palestine lurched to the far right during Donald Trump's term as U.S. president. Benjamin Netanyahu took advantage of Trump's unmitigated support for Israel to oversee the installation of more illegal settlement infrastructure in occupied Palestine than had been built in the previous quarter century. Sadly, replacing the Trump administration with a Democratic one has hardly remedied the damage his policies wrought. If anything, if anything, the situation is more dire for Palestinians. For over half a century, followers of the late Rabbi Meir Kahane, colloquially, colloquially called Kahanists, the most racist and most murderous Jewish political movement of modern times, have cultivated an alarming level of influence on both sides of the aisle. In his 36-page piece, David uncovers how for decades ostensibly liberal lawmakers at the highest levels of the Democratic Party have actively courted and embraced Kahanists, pandering to those who have sabotaged the struggle for Palestinian rights and enthusiastically promoted their ethnic cleansing. David Sheen is a Haifa-based freelance investigative journalist who has reported for dozens of local, regional, and international news outlets. It's so good to have you with us on the Electronic Intifada podcast, David. It's great to be back. Great to see you guys. So let's get right into it. Um, talk about the current Israeli government, which is full of open kahanas, and how the Biden administration is continuing a tradition in U.S. White Houses. Uh, you write that, quote, for decades, ostensibly liberal lawmakers at the highest levels of the Democratic Party have actively courted Kahanis, uh, pandering to those who have enthusiastically promoted the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. What do you mean by that? Um, and how does that play out? And how does it look right now in Biden's administration? Well, the bulk of the work actually looks at the past 50 years, well before Biden gets into power, of course. Under Biden, if we fast forward just to the last few months, um, in May 2022, so just going back uh, about 15 months ago, that's when Biden officially announced, the State Department announced that the group Kahana Chai, founded by followers of Kahana, would no longer be considered a terrorist organization, according to the State Department. And what that did essentially was give Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, 
and blank check, saying to him, We've got no problem with you bringing Kahanists into your new government. And that's exactly what happened as soon as Netanyahu came back to power. A few months later, he did exactly that. He brought these people who, as you've correctly stated, are the most racist and most murderous of the Jewish political movements of the last half century, brought them into the Israeli government. They are now considered the kingmakers of the Knesset. They're the third largest faction in the government, key to holding up any government of Netanyahu. And of course, that's a, a frightening development that a terrorist group, a murderous terrorist group now is not only in the government, but it, you could say has the most important or most powerful positions in said government. The governments, including the defense ministry, the police ministry. So these are the ministries that have a monopoly on physical force. So to give the biggest murderers the power over life or death is sickening and scary. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the essay really relates to the last 50 years, as I've said, going back to the early 1970s, which is the earliest that I was able to know that this collaboration began. And the collaboration essentially was one of community support for votes. Now, we have to just quick, briefly look back at the last century of American politics. I'll be the first to say I'm not an American. I, I've never been an American citizen or lived in the United States, you know, spent, you know, only brief visits there. And really, this should have been written by an American journalist, someone based in the U.S. at the very least. But no, no journalist did, so no one picked up the glove. And so I had to do so. But what I found was that, uh, yeah, going back 100 years, 100 years already, already, you have a majority of the Jewish community in the United States voting for the Democratic Party consistently. We can see for the last century, consistently, Jewish Americans vote for the Democratic uh, candidate for president in much higher percentages than the average American would vote for the Democratic candidate. That's, that's consistent. So what the Democrats you know, is seeing that they have a lock on the Jewish vote, essentially, not not completely, of course, there is diversity within the Jewish community, like every community, but there is a tendency to vote more liberal, let's say, or to the Democrats. So because of that, if a politician wanted to so-called get the Jewish vote, then their way to do so is to present themselves as a Democrat. And Kahanists realize this, they realize that that's how they're going to get the Jewish vote that's already there in the Democratic camp. And so that's why you have a Kahanist terrorist, Dov Heikind, playing off of his record as a terrorist and entering politics in the early 1980s. He's actually the first Kahanist to come to power, even before Kahana himself gets a Knesset seat here in Israel. A year earlier, Dov Heikind gets a seat in the New York State Assembly. And he does this based on his terrorist record, appealing to people as a former Kahanist. So, yes. And okay, so that's, you know, one, of course, the idea is that once he does that, you, you know, he has no basis for being there. Historically, all of his positions are retrograde and racist. Um, and we looked consistently over his record from back in the day, which no one had really done. Um, he is vociferously speaking out against gay rights. You know, this is at a time when gay people are suffering from the AIDS epidemic and people are dying in droves. And there is an effort to step up and show solidarity with queer folks. And at the very least, make it illegal to fire someone from their job uh, or turf, you know, kick someone out of the apartment that they're living in on the, you know, just over the, the fact that they're gay or lesbian or bisexual, et cetera, et cetera. And he comes out and says, no, these, you know, th this is disgusting, blah, 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 whatever he says, he's a, he vocally opposes it. Same thing uh, around, you know, race, racial issues. You know, he says, we need to fight for, you know, white people are being discriminated against. We need to stand up for white people's rights. I mean, just <laughs> the most retrograde opinions yeah. that you can imagine. So they obviously had no place in the Democratic Party, but by running as a Democrat, you know, he could then ensure that no person could take a position to the right of that. Because, if, you know, if he's 
if he's a if he's taking that position and he's on the so-called liberal side of the spectrum, then it right. kind of sets the bar for what a politician is expected to say in terms of their support for Israel or what positions are going to stake out. Okay, that's that's him. That's an out and out Kahanist. But the bulk of the piece isn't about this disgusting man, but rather about the disgusting men that weren't themselves politicians, but who had the ears of politicians, who held them close and were their uh, personal spiritual leaders. Essentially, um, they're, they're, you know, the people who um, collected their votes, because as Heiken himself explained very well, the way that he was able to get elected is by going from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi and going to his district, which has probably the largest proportion of ultra-Orthodox Jews of any right or districts in the United States of America. And so by going to the leader of that community, and because in general, these communities are very close knit and they're very, uh, you know, they listen to the rabbi, whatever the rabbi says goes, all it takes is for to come to a deal with the rabbi. The rabbi says, this is how you should vote. And then the community votes nearly as a block, you know, in respect for the rabbi, they do whatever he says. This is not my words, but Hikins. And so he would go for and elicit the support and then funnel them. Now, of course, Hikins himself did it in order to funnel votes to Republican candidates, ironically. For decades, he's been funneling votes to the Republicans, even though he's a Democrat. He supported Republican after Republican after far right Republican candidate. But um, in, in the case of other rabbis, they would strike deals with Democratic lawmakers. So in the early 1970s, you have you know, maybe the, the, the most racist rabbi in the city of New York. He's the head of Yeshiva University's Theological Seminary. This is like the, uh, the intelligentsia of New York orthodoxy. The, you know, the uh, very mainstream. I'm not going to the fringes. I'm not going to, you know, some dark alleys anywhere. This is the Orthodox Jewish community's principal institution of learning, Yeshiva University. And this man is the dean of the Theological Seminary. And he conducts Kahana's funeral services and praises him and, you know, fire and brimstone at his opposition. And, and you know, he'd always in, invite Kahana to speak. And, and so this is, and over the years, over the decades, he would continue to stake out the most racist far-right positions, even on Israeli politics. You know, when no one, when no Orthodox rabbi had a temerity to speak out in, in support of the rabbi's letter of 2010 that said no Jews may sell or rent apartments to non-Jews in Israel. He was like the lone voice who stood out and said, yes, this is right, this is correct. We need to stop renting apartments to non-Jews. In, uh, you know, out for decades, you know, Orthodox rabbis said, no, 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 we shouldn't go up to Haram al-Sharif. You know, it's the holiest uh, or third holiest Muslim site. It's the oldest, oldest Muslim structure still standing. You know, from the ancient world, it's, uh, it's the most beautiful building in Palestine. Anyways, let's not uh, freak out a million Muslim, billion Muslims around the world and let, allow it to be a, a Muslim shrine. But this man, this racist rabbi, he went out, Moshe Tendler was his name. He went out and he organized support. And he said, yes, every time we need to go up, we need to take back Aram sharif We need to, you know, of course, the plan of the Templars is to demolish the mosques right. there and to build a temple slash abattoir to Yahweh on its ruins. So he spoke out in front of, you know, on behalf of the most radical far right positions of the Jewish community. And he was the political, um, you know, spiritual leader of Democratic DA of Kings County. All right. Now, how did that for, happen? <laughs> right. How would that happen? You yeah. would ask. But it happened again and again. He wasn't yeah. an exception to the rule. You also had the person who was above him. If he was the dean of the theological seminary, then you have the dean of the entire university, Herbert Bomser. And he also, of course, hosted Kahana in his synagogue. You have to hear it was his, is his synagogue that hosted also the memorial services after Kahana died. So, you know, huge Kahana supporter, the head of the New York um, you know, educational, uh, you know, this is educational institution, Yeshiva University, and consistently, those who were running for high office in New York City would come to him and seek his approval. And then, once they got it, once 
they were able to convince them to you know to 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 support their candidacy for, they would publicly announce it you know they'd be proud to let other people know here this racist rabbi supports my candidacy for mayor so you should also so you should do so follow the rabbi and and vote for me so this happens again and again and again and it's never challenged it's right. no journalist even is speaking out and certainly no opposition to you know you would expect one of the candidates running against that candidate to bring this up but mum's the word it's never discussed it's never spoken about so in this way it's really difficult to measure the effect because you know these candidates don't run on a kahana's candidate besides you know dove heikent we don't have anyone running uh with you know under the title i am a kahanist and i'm going to support kahana's proposals we only you know it's the backroom deals that we only learn about now after the fact but you know in retrospect we can read their political histories and just imagine how many decisions they had to make how often the their politics played into their you know their votes and it's shocking to see the amount of power that they swayed and and this includes of course the most powerful political families in the democratic party right Right. Uh, let's get more into that. Um, okay. I mean, just, you know, now uh, with with Israel's most uh, openly, honestly mm. um, genocidal mm. uh, government mm. um, in power with Biden. You, I remember, you know, uh, several months ago, there was like a will he or won't he invite Netanyahu to the White House? And there was this kind of like very um uh, fake sort of you know struggle in the Biden administration of like well Netanyahu's a step too far um it, you know we don't want to want it to seem like we're supporting all of his policies even though of course the blank checks keep rolling in mm -hmm. um and and now you know we have the 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 uh, inclusion waiver. the yeah the inclusion of Israel into the visa waiver program which is a uh, giving Israel the green light to continue its policies of racism and you know, apartheid and discrimination and segregation. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, what, what that signals um, in terms of uh, embracing the ideologies that have always been part and parcel of, uh, of Israel, um, uh, of Zionism and, um, and 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 what it says about the Biden administration right now. Mm -hmm. So, look, it's no secret that you know Israel's history is a bloody one, and that the Zionist movement committed atrocities against Palestinians. There's that's in the historical record. However, at the same time, um, when the guns were silent, when the wars ended. Uh, and the smoke cleared, it became embarrassing for Israel's leaders to continue ethnic cleansing when it's no longer wartime. So, um, and, and that's because for the most part, for the first three decades, at least of its history, Israel's leaders were, let's just call them centrist Zionists, but they were certainly secular Zionists that we can agree on. And meaning, you know, they didn't believe in God, but they believe that God gave them the right over the land of Israel. Um, but in any case, it, it meant that the regime that they established here was one of ethnocracy in which, you know, if, even before we get into territories occupied, even for people who are, for non-Jews who are citizens, they are citizens minus. The, the state gives rights and privileges on the basis of ethnicity. So Israel's always been an ethnocracy, but for the Kahanists and other monarchists, that's not sufficient. They, of course, want Israel to transition and become a monarchy, a, a religious theocracy that's headed by a king that not only has non-Jews in their midst, that, you know, have a smaller set of rights and that can be used to do labor that Jews don't want to do, um, but that the non-Jews will eventually be ethnically cleansed of. Now, for many Orthodox Jews, even though that is like a part and parcel of their 
set of religious beliefs. Historically, ultra-Orthodox Jews have been pacifists. You know, they didn't actively, for the most part, take part in the Zionist movement of establishing the state because they believed that, first of all, they want to see, as I said, a religious state, not a secular state, and also because they believe that it should be from God, that it shouldn't be through their hands, that they build the state they want to see, that it should be God who makes that change in the world. And so traditionally, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jews, at least, did not actively involve themselves in the Zionist movement. But after 1967, after the Six-Day War, the Second War, where Israel tripled its territory and conquered territories from all the nations around it, at that point, and of course this included the holy sites that we discussed, Haran al-Sharif in Jerusalem, also in Hebron, the uh, Ibrahimi Mosque, etc., etc. And at that point, uh, it kind of put Orthodox Jews into a Messiah mode, we can say, or beast mode, you know, to use a video game term. And what, what that did was, for many of them, they said, okay, well, you know, we were pacifists up until now because, you know, we put off that uh, statecraft for the Messianic age. We said, you know, God and God's messenger is supposed to bring that into being. But if Israel is in fact now powerful enough to conquer all its rivals in the region, take over more territory and do as it will and how, without having pushback, then maybe we're in the Messianic era. After all, that's what Maimonides says. You don't need, you know, some temple to fall down from the sky to bring the Messianic era into effect. You just need a leader strong enough to, you know, to expand Israel's borders and bring the Jews back into the country, and that's sufficient. So many uh, Orthodox Jews began to go from pacifists to activists and thinking that the Messianic era has arrived, and that means we need to bring the the, uh, the Messianic vision. Me and that, of course, means no non-Jews in the country. Now, obviously, uh, as I said, Israel although it had committed ethnic cleansings during the war, 700,000 Palestinian refugees in the first war in 48, another 300,000 in the second war in 67, and their descendants. But, you know, when, when the war wasn't on, it was just trickling. It was just policies geared to make Palestinians' lives more miserable so that eventually they wouldn't maybe not fight back, but become so frustrated that they decide to leave. That's kind of the overall effect of, you know, half a century plus of colonization with the boot on your neck. But for the messiness, it's not fast enough. Even the right-wing Netanyahu government isn't ethnically cleansing fast enough. They want it to happen and as soon as possible. And so they hoped to jumpstart the process. And so Kahana immigrates here from the U.S. after already he's got a Rabbi Meir Kahana, you know, in the late 1960s starts up his movement, starting with a movement he calls the Jewish Defense League. And he's already committing terrorist attacks in the United States. But after a few years of these, American uh, American courts try him and let him know, well, if you're not going to go to jail, then you, you, we got to leave the country. You better move to Israel or else we're going to send you to jail. So he moves here, launches his political career and launches his terrorist career, starts a terrorist movement that, you know, murders Palestinians, uh, inspires, you know, stochastic terrorism by calling for ethnic cleansing so on one hand inciting you know random strangers to go out and murder palestinians but of course he also preaches directly to his close uh, group of followers who follow him from the u.s who move from new york city to to the occupied territories with them and they themselves become kahana's killers both here in palestine and some who then head back to the united states to commit more murders back in the u.s uh like the the assassination of Alex Saudi in 1985. So this is the Kahanist movement. For years, they've been a terrorist group and is on the peak of their, of their, you know, list of murders occurred in 1994. That's when a uh, follower of Kahana who moved again from the U.S., Baruch Goldstein, he goes into the Ibrahimi Mosque and he massacres 29 men and boys at prayer during Friday Ramadan services you know, wounding over a hundred more. And at that point, that's when the Israeli government says, okay, the Kahanist movement is a terrorist movement. And also at that time with uh, the Clinton government in power and the Oslo peace process uh, for what it's worth, just, you know, starting to try to come together. And that's what the, the Goldstein massacre is a response to. And so Clinton, also the American government calls 
the Kahanist groups, terrorist groups. So they've always, you know, at least since then, been acknowledged to be terrorist groups. And this is what Biden reversed in recent day, in, in, in recent months, rather. Now it's saying even that small effort. And, and keep in mind that even though the American government did officially declare Kahanists to be terrorists, it never stopped them from fundraising. Even in the months that followed, they continued fundraising in New York City and throughout the United States. And it's because of the monies that they receive from millionaires in the United States. You know, it's not crowdfunding like $50 here, $50 here, although there were those, of course. But it's um, the millionaire backers that they were able to, you know, funnel these these monies to the communist movement and support their terrorist activities and still do to this day. And yet, that's, you know, these terrorist funding networks have never been cracked down upon in all those decades. So really, when Biden took the Kahanists off the terror group list, it wasn't a major difference on the ground. But at least at the declarative level, they no longer have that to say. They can't even say we consider them terrorists any longer. And OK, so, you know, ostensibly the reason why he did so allegedly is because they're no longer active. Now, I can tell you that just last week I was in Jerusalem and I walked out of the train station and I saw a young girl, teen, probably teenager, maybe 15 years old, with a Kahana Chai necklace, golden necklace around her neck. I said, oh, wow, do you mind if I take a photograph? She said, oh, sure, no problem. So, yes, this is, group is very active. They're active to the point that they're in government. They're active to the point where on the streets of Israel, they carry their flag. They're active to the point where they are calling for their murderers to be released. And, you know, they're in power. And the people in power... You know, some of them actually are former terrorists themselves or trained by former terrorists. And now the terrorists of their movement who are sitting in jail or who are arrested either for having committed murder or being suspected of murder, these Kahanist MKs or MPs, law, you know, lawmakers from the Kahana movement, they are calling for the release and for, to support these Kahanist killers. Yes, they're active. They're hella active. To say they're inactive is, is a gross distortion. Of course, Biden did that for political reasons, because he clearly, like many other Democratic lawmakers over the decades, wants the Kahanist vote. I don't think he's going to get the average Kahanist to vote for him, but clearly he doesn't want to run afoul of them. And most importantly, because they were key to bring Netanyahu back in power. Um, it's a really sad, sick phenomenon to observe, but that's that's the situation I, obviously the united states government there's no shortage of um you know crimes that it can be accused of but helping to resuscitate the kahana movement and build it to the point where where it has its hands on the steering wheel of the state that's an unforgivable crime yeah 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 i think it's the really i'm glad you've explained there some more of the background of who rabbi maya kahana was because, you know, we've talked a lot about Kahanis and there's a lot of talk about Kahanis, especially since the Kahanis joined the Israeli coalition government. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to get the background there. It's just, I mean, it's it's worth mentioning and remembering that, as you said, Kahana started his movement in Brooklyn, in New York, in the very, very end of the 1960s. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that, right about 1969. And... Um, yeah, the Jewish, the so-called Jewish Defense League, uh, was a Zionist terrorist organization, which was, you know, it was literally um, bombing. The, it was carrying out a terror campaign in the United States throughout nineteen um, seventies, uh, nineteen eighties. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, against Palestinian targets. You know, I, I believe they they targeted the office of, of Edward Said at one point. Um, Palestinian targets, Arab targets, and also um, Soviet targets, because you know there was this whole um, campaign of uh, around related to Soviet Jewry at the time. Um, and as you said, they then moved. He then moved to Israel to occupy Palestine um, in the early eighties. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, he actually moved here in the nineteen seventies, okay. and he ran for Knesset several times in the 70s and then only managed to enter the Knesset in 1984. Right. And so for those that one term from 1984 to 1988, Kahana himself served in the Knesset. And 
close to the end of his term, actually, because because of you know the fact that he was up on stage and and he had this platform, to, you know, and he managed to draw so much popularity that it was expected if he would run again in the next election that he would have got not one seat but maybe ten seats or more, which for sure would have made him a minister. That would have meant that this wave of Kahanism. Uh, entering government would have, you know, would have been something that we'd be dealing with in the late '80s. At that point, even the right-wing Likud government that was in power since the late '70s, even they were put off by Kahana's overt racism. It wasn't that there wasn't anti-Arab racism, but at least, you know, they have somewhat of a a, a tradition in the Likud party that it, it was just a step beyond for them. So. I mean, they themselves led the effort to drum Kahana out of the Knesset by passing a law that said, well, if you explicitly, overtly, you know, incite racism, then you can't be considered a candidate for Knesset. And in fact, that's why... Just be more quiet about it. Yeah, subtle. <laughs> Subtlety is the key, right? Yeah, and I, I got his book. Uh, what, this is one of Kahana's books from the 80s <laughs> in English. It's literally called They Must Go. <laughs> Um, and it's actually helpfully you can read it in full on the internet archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is from the inner cover. It's saying in this explosive manifesto, Rabbi Kahane says forth the only plan to save Israel. Israeli Arabs would be given the option of accepting non-citizenship, leaving willingly in compensation, or being forcibly expelled without compensation. So he's calling for the. He was openly calling for the mass expulsion of Palestinians from all of historic Palestine, you know, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and the 1948 territories. Uh, and as you said, like he was saying openly what other Israeli politicians were uh, were trying to do in, in different ways and more subtle ways. I suppose he was kind of an embarrassment in that way. But, yes. you know, he, you know, this, what this, I mean, I've put this up on screen a few times as well. That when I first went to Palestine, this was one of the things I, this sticker stuck out to me i saw it all over the place i saw it in jerusalem i saw it especially in hebron um at places where there was a lot of israeli settlements say as you know it says in hebrew today everyone knows kahane was right mm. um i you know this wikipedia photo is from 20 uh, 2010 um you know so you know th this is someone who's been incredibly influential on israeli politics <laughs> Their idea was, you know, just to keep pushing it to the far right, to stake out the most far right positions possible and keep attacking from the far right. And they've managed to drag the entire political system in Israel further and further to the far right extremes. And as you pointed out, there's no shortage of, uh, you know, uh, crimes that the government is, is guilty of, but there's no question at the same time that in recent years and decades that that what is considered the right has shifted further and further and further to the point where now you have even, you know, members of the Likud party openly calling for another Nakba. And it's very difficult now to distinguish the rhetoric. If you just read a sentence, it's almost difficult to say, well, was that made by a Kahanist MP or a Likud MP? Mm -hmm. Very, very similar in terms of their... Right. I, I think you made strategy. the point in one of your articles for EI a few years ago that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that this was before, obviously, the Kahanis re-entered the coalition government. There was no need for Kah, that is, the Kah party, Rabbi Maya mm -hmm. Kahane's Israeli political party. There was no need for that party to be unbanned in Israel because their politics had already entered the Likud party and the other yeah. Israeli parties. Yes. One of the things that I point out um, <clears throat> in the monograph is that this was a plan that was hatched by the Kahana movement uh, in New York City decades ago. And it was all there. If anyone cared, if any New York City journalist, Jewish or non-Jewish, had done their due diligence and had just attended the meetings of the Kahanists, because they openly say every year they have memorial services to honor Kahana and his legacy. So if anyone with a critical opinion had attended these, which they could have, and then, you know, exposed them, we would have known about these racist figures in the Democratic Party and their plots um, decades earlier. But what happened was they, they said openly at that time, we are now trying to do a corporate takeover of the ruling Likud party. 
we are now, you know, signing up to be members of the Likud party. Kahanists are starting to be members of the Likud party. And now we are increasing our size, the size of our bloc in the party. The point is to create the largest independent bloc in the Likud so that eventually we will be like, uh, have another, for, you know, like point of gravity so that other Likud lawmakers or those who aspire to become Likud lawmakers would gravitate towards our way of thinking and will need to seek our approval in order to become uh, candidates for the Knesset. And, th and they did that. They, they were extremely explicit in their plan and they carried out their plan. The first uh, member of Knesset that they fielded, you know, became the speaker of the Knesset, Moshe Feiglin. And Moshe Feiglin, uh, of course, over the years, has, you know, set, called for ethnic cleansing, called for, you know, bring, you know, kicking out all the Gaza and the Palestinians in Gaza and bringing Jews back to Gaza. And, you know, of course, demolishing the, the mosques and Faram al-Sharif and building this abattoir there, et cetera, et cetera. He's always staked out these extreme positions, but he'd never really worn the Kahanist logo on his lapel. But of course, all these decades later, once the Kahana revolution has swept over the Likud, and now that Ben Gvir is, you know, accepted in the halls of the Likud party and embraced, and in fact, more popular there than any of the Likud leaders themselves, now it's 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 cool to say you're a Kahanis. So now he comes out of the closet as a Kahanis. Now Feiglin, you know, attends publicly attends their meetings openly, unabashedly, you know, praising Kahana. Yes, Kahana was at my wedding. We studied Torah together, and blah blah blah. And of course, he's right. He's always you know he was always right. And so there's a lot of mask dropping now. Mm -hmm. But still, even after the fact, no one's really reporting on sadly. Um, but yeah, this this was a plan that was hatched in New York onto Palestine. And it really also shows not only the, uh, you know, the, how the American political system is become so infiltrated by Congress, but it also shows how the mainstream media in the United States has, you know, become so toothless that even when you have the biggest racists of the Jewish community, there's no effort to shine a light on them and ask questions about what's, is it appropriate that they have this much political power? Right. All right. Uh, David, uh, you tweeted about this a, a couple of days ago. Haaretz mm -hmm. ran an article about yet another sexual predator in Hollywood finding refuge in Israel. Um, this mm -hmm. time it's director Brett Ratner, who didn't just move to Israel, but he was a, a special guest of Netanyahu during the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. Tell us why this is significant and how it really kind of ties into to, to, to what Israel mm -hmm. is and, and has, always, has always been. Well, it's interesting that we're talking about this. Uh, just to bring it back to the Kahanis specifically for a moment, then we'll yeah. widen out to talk about Netanyahu and the Likud party in Israel in general. So it has to be said that one of the aspects of the kind of now of course we've already talked about the damage it does to palestinians on the ground but you know the kahana movement also one of the uh you know we can say um one of the other victims of the kahana movement have been women because they are an enthusiastic supporter of the men's rights movement mm. and here in israel there the kahanists have been some of the most ardent supporters of the biggest sex criminals, you know, uh, showing, you know, I'm of course, in recent years, there's, there's, there's no, we can't say that rape culture is specific to Israel. Of course not. Rape culture is a problem everywhere in the world. Okay. So everywhere, every country has to combat rape culture, but that's up on the leaders of the country. What we have here in this country to begin with, even before we get the kind of into the mix is one in which Netanyahu has consistently, you know, remember he's, been, he's the longest serving Israeli prime minister. He's been in power for most of the last quarter century. Um, and during his time in office, he has consistently all these sex criminals from his camp. What do you mean from his camp? From his office. You have, you know, directors of his office coming up on sex charges, being convicted of sex crimes, and then, you know, being, or, you know, being thrown out of office because it's embarrassing once it comes out that they're sex criminals, and then they are brought back into Netanyahu's office again, once the public isn't noticing, these sex criminals are brought back in to work in Netanyahu's office, and then they're again accused of sex crimes, once again. You know, his, from it, it's his, uh, the directors of his office, 
it's his spokespeople, it's his drivers. Uh, I'm not saying it's him himself, but it starts to become suspicious when all around you are every, people feel like they can rape willy nilly. And of course, the only time, the only time that he ever notices that rape culture is an endemic problem in society and needs to be combated for the sake of all women in society, Jewish, Palestinian, and else, that, you know, the, the one times when he suspects that a rape was Arab on Jew, when a Palestinian has been accused of raping a Jewish woman. This came to the fore a few years ago when there was an incident that this happened, it was reported in the news. <gasps> Finally, Netanyahu speaks out about, oh my God, this is disgusting. How dare they do this? And then a couple of days later, it turns out the entire story had been manufactured. I'm not saying that never happens, but in this specific case, when Netanyahu spoke out about it, the only time he speaks out about rape, turns out it was a false claim to frame a Palestinian. I guess the woman's parents were embarrassed that she was dating a Palestinian. So to protect her honor, they smeared him as a rapist. In any case, you know, this is the Netanyahu government. But of course, in recent weeks, what we've seen is the passage of a new law in Israel, right. which increases the punishments for rape if you're Palestinian. So what that does is essentially gives a gift to Jewish rapists. If you're going to rape, don't worry about it because your punishment will be less than a non-Jewish rapist. This is the kinds of messaging that comes from the top. Sad and sickeningly, there's no F concrete effort to, you know, across society acknowledge that sexual harassment is a problem we need to combat it. No, it's only a problem when they're after our women, mm -hmm. right? But of course, that's a subset of the generalized fear of, uh, you know, Jews and non-Jews connecting and forging social relationships and romantic relationships that this government and all previous governments have funnels money into anti-miscegenation groups that work to recolonize so-called mixed cities, the few, the handful of cities in the country where Jews and Palestinians live side by side, not perfectly, but in some measure of living together. So the efforts of these missionary groups of moving from the settlements back, you know, from the West Bank occupied territories back into 48 territories to uh, to these mixed towns and to try to sow divisions and to, to break up mixed couples and they'll harass and harangue mixed couples and, you know, parade through the streets looking for examples of this and, of course, attacking non-Jews to drive them out of the areas, the, you know, let's say the downtown areas where young people tend to congregate at night and where teenagers flirt and fall in love. So the idea is to clear those public spaces of non-Jews and if there are non-Jews in them, attack them, beat them, uh, put the fear of death in them so that they won't occupy those areas anymore and thereby, you know, completely remove the possibility that there will be any social interaction or certainly sexual interaction between Jews and non-Jews. So it, it's it's not that they're afraid of Arab on Jew rape. They're afraid of Arab on Jew love. Mm -hmm. And that's what their efforts are geared towards crushing. It's very reminiscent of what you're talking about of the Jim Crow South, of course, in the United States where, mm -hmm. you know, black men would quite often be falsely accused of raping white women you know the most mm -hmm. famous or, or even just you know yeah killed for or attacked for just flirting with white women the most dead famous case of course being Emmett Till you're absolutely right and as I pointed out uh we had our own Emmett Till just a few years ago in this case wasn't a Palestinian in this specific case it happened to be an African refugee but the same logic there was a man who was a person of color easily identified because in that town there there were no black you know, let's just say uh it was clearly it was obvious you can kind of sometimes tell culture cultural divisions so it was obvious based on his clothing that he was a non-jewish african man he was seen uh talking to some jewish women and this occurred right outside the city hall of petah tikva which is a suburb of Tel Aviv that is twinned with Chicago of all places. So in this right outside City Hall, the CCTV cameras of City Hall film, this black man walking up to these women, talking to them for 10 seconds and walking away. And then a group of Jews jump on him and beat him to death for over an hour. Mm. Beat him, stomp on him, murder him. 
because he talked to a white woman. So in this specific case, it was a, not a Palestinian, but a non-Jewish African refugee, but the same logic, their hatred of non-Jewish and, you know, of interracial relationships has, has filtered down to, you know, the dregs of society to the point where you just say it and they'll do it. They'll carry it out. And that's what we see. That's what we see on the streets today. Well, finally, David, um, it, you know, after researching and documenting and publishing this this piece uh, for the Institute for Palestine Studies, where where does this leave Palestinians um, in terms of you know the the apartheid uh, government of Israel entrenching, solidifying? claiming more and more power, um, deeper alliances with with uh, American politicians on both sides of the uh, ostensible aisle, as though there is one these days. <laughs> um, what uh, what are your your uh, your deepest fears about the continuation of this trend uh, where Kahanis are rehabilitated? I mean, just, you know, the just in the last couple of weeks of course we sure. saw uh in your uh, home country of canada mm -hmm. um the the rehabilitation of uh of nazi uh ss officers in mm -hmm. parliament mm -hmm. um standing ovations you know given because of um canada's uh you know support of uh, it, it you know it just revealed Canada's longtime support for the last eighty years of, yes. of Nazis. Yeah. Um, so just like this, this kind of you know you talked about the mask off situation. How sure. um, this is really revealing so much about about what Israel has always mm -hmm. been, about what the U.S. and Canada has always been, um, about who they're willing to support in order to um, prop up. Uh, political aims and hegemonic aims um, in other countries. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about where sure. where you think this oh, this goes from here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Well, certainly, you know, I've been warning about this for years. It feels like we've got a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, because Israel can now always point to another country. Every country can point to another country. Sure. The, the you know is as the more Israel gets further to the further to the far right the more racist it gets the more countries run to it and clamor to purchase its weapons and so instead of people taking a step back just the opposite is happening and of course when one country commits it when israel commits the crime it gives license to others and when others do then it gives license to israel to do so so we got a race to the bottom sadly sickeningly um it seems like that's happening globally as you know so I, but it's no, uh, it's cold comfort to mm. see that. Um, I'm going to mention something that is not often mentioned. I thought I might give it some prominence, sadly, because it's there's no focus on it. But right here in Haifa, okay? So the reason why I bring this up is because people speak of the city as if it's like some model of coexistence. You know, here, you come up here, it proves the Jews and the Arabs can get along. And of course, that's true. We don't need the city to prove that we've got hundreds of years of coexistence but but in this city that supposedly a palestinian people have you know it's a long story but if we accept the premise for a brief moment that palestinians here speak uh arabic openly on the street in certain areas because they feel comfortable enough in their arab identity so it's like a little bubble of safety you know part of the reason that i live here in the city but here, even in the so-called coexistence capital of Haifa, what's happening? We see the Hebronization of Haifa. Yeah. So just down the street here, on the top of Mount Carmel, is a monastery, a Christian Carmelite monastery called Stella Maris. It's been here, you know, they've got a thousand year history in this city. Um, so no one can, and, and I should point out that they were the first to build a structure on the Mount Carmel. Before that, there wasn't that there was a Jewish synagogue there or a Jewish monument there, and then Christians came after, which sometimes is the case, you know, over the course of the centuries that one religion builds on top of the temple of another, and the church becomes a mosque, and the mosque becomes a church, etc. That has happened, but not here on Mount Carmel. This is a, has been a Christian monastery, you know, going back a thousand years. And now what do you see? Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jews coming and entering the monastery and praying there in the Jewish manner, 
And of course, they're doing the objective is they're claiming that it, it's a that there was a Jewish sage buried there, and so therefore they're trying to take over the site, just as they managed to take over half of the Ibrahimi Mosque, the cave of the right. patriarchs, and just as they want to do step by step on Haram al Sharif. So even here in Haifa, you have this exclusively Christian site. And I might point out just further down the hill, they're like literally stones throw away. There is a Jewish site, the cave of Elijah. Originally, it was a holy site to Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Druze. But once 48 happened, Israel took over the site. It's now exclusively a Jewish site. So there's an exclusively Jewish religious site, literally you know, a few meters down the hill. But no, they've got to take over this Christian site. And you know what I'm most saddened by? Where are the so-called lefty liberals of Haifa? Mm. You know, there hasn't been any solidarity with the Christian community. Well, actually, that's not true. I saw some Jews folks uh, driving through and coming to, out to support their, you know, Christian brothers and sisters here. But I haven't seen any Jewish liberals come out to support the Christians here. Now, this is, of course, just one small story and we're kind of veering off from the focus. But the point is to show that there is no sign of hope. It's not that, OK, everything's bad, but at least we're on. No, the trajectory is going downhill and it's getting steeper and steeper. And I don't see any positive signs on the horizon that there's going to be any rollback or pushback, even from the people you'd expect to be loyal allies. Sadly, I think that Palestinians and those in solidarity with them are looking at a very dark future in the coming months and years. Oh. <laughs> well, um, we are uh, very, um, as always, just uh, really, you know, privileged to to be in connection with you and to have your work featured on the Electronic Intifada as. Really, you know, I mean, we're, you know, sometimes we are here to give platforms to prophets of doom. <laughs> no one gives me hope, David. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because you're doing the work of documenting this. It's not lost to history. It's not, um, you know, it, it can't be, it can't be rewritten. Um, and, mm -hmm. and we're just, we're very indebted to your work over the years. Um, that is the voice and image of David Sheen. He's an investigative journalist. His, uh, newest piece is, um, for the Institute for Palestine Studies. It's called Kahanism and American Politics, the Democratic Party's Decades Long Courtship of Racist Fanatics. We'll have a link to that and to your previous articles here on the Electronic Intifada uh, on the podcast post that accompanies this broadcast. David Sheen, thank you so much for all that you do and for being with us on the Electronic Intifada podcast. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both for the work that you do. Thanks for having me on today. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.